Hello, today we're talking about how to teach Crimson from Sketches in Color by Robert Starr. And I'm also gonna use this piece as a jumping off point for talking about asymmetrical meter and mixed meter. This particular piece sounds like this. There's a lot more to this piece, but I wanted to get in far enough that you could kind of get the gist of it. If we haven't met before, my name is Jana Williamson and welcome to my home piano studio in the suburbs of Chicago. I love this piece and I love this whole set of pieces. If you're not familiar with them, they come in, this is a very old copy of this book, which is still available today. Sketches in Color, Seven Pieces for Piano by Robert Starr. This is set one. There is a set two and you can also buy them in one complete volume of set one and set two together in one book. So today, before we actually talk about this particular piece, I want to talk about mixed meter and asymmetrical meter. And this was a request from my dear friend, Christina Whitlock over at the Beyond Measure podcast. If you're a music teacher and you haven't checked out her podcast, please do so. I will be sure to link it in the description of this video. So mixed meter simply means that we have different time signatures in one movement of a piece. So you might have a few bars of three, four time, followed by a bar of four, four time, followed by a bar of six, eight, whatever it is, the composer has the right to change the time signature whenever he or she wants to. This didn't really start happening until the 20th century, of course. We don't have this in the Romantic and Classical eras. And it's one expression of the fact that in the 20th century, in contemporary or modern styles, rhythm is extremely important. And composers play around with a lot of different rhythmic devices. So again, mixed meter is the changing of time signature. Asymmetrical meter would be any time you're using something that's asymmetrical. And this typically happens when the top value in a time signature is five or seven. But of course, it's not totally limited to that. Those are just the most common. So you can find pieces in five, four time or in five, eight time or in seven, eight time. And this particular piece, Crimson, is written in seven, eight time. It does not change the time signature. But the reason I'm talking about both of these is that whenever you're dealing with mixed meter or asymmetrical meter, the most important thing in teaching your students is to feel a standard and consistent micro pulse. So in this piece, the eighth note is that repeated note that we have in this main theme as the accompaniment. And the melody is this. So if I count that in seven, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like that. Most pieces in 7-8 feel like they go 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, or the flip of that. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2. And of course, your two groups of two can turn into four. So it could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, or the, the reverse of that. But we get a lot of 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3. This goes all the way back to Bartok's Dances in Bulgarian Rhythm. Um, I'm sure that you have all heard those before. The number two is one of the most popular teaching pieces that happens to be in book eight of the festival collection. And I'll link all these pieces um, in the description below. But I'm sure you've heard this before. It's a very popular teaching piece. If you'd like me to do a video on that one, leave a comment in the comments below and I'll try to do a whole video just on that one. So that is also in what we would call 7-8, although Bartok actually puts as the time signature 2 plus 2 plus 3, which is really, I think, what we're also feeling in Crimson. Okay, so other examples of asymmetrical meter um, show up in jazz music, certainly. If you know Dave Brubeck's Take 5. <laughs> Um, 
um, it's one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. We also have that influence on both Christopher Norton. He writes some pieces in five and seven in his Connections books and elsewhere, of course, because he's got a lot of jazz styles in those books. Kevin Olson also writes beautifully um, in jazz and contemporary styles. So Imaginations book three and book four both have an asymmetrical meter piece. In book three, it is called High Five and it's in five, four time. And in book four, it is the um, Vals, sorry, not Vals, Nocturne Romantique, and that's in 5-8. So both of those are in five. So those are examples of asymmetrical meter, not necessarily changing meter or mixed meter, but asymmetrical. A few examples of mixed meter, uh, another Bartok, Bartok is so great for everything rhythmic, um, I'm looking at the 20th century intermediate level from the Hal Leonard Library here. And this is the jeering song from Four Children, Volume 1. It starts in 3-4, but then mixes in a lot of 2-4 as well. So, one, two, three. And that continues through the whole piece. So again, in that, the reason this feels like asymmetrical meter is that that quarter note pulse, for instance, in that particular piece needs to be steady. Regardless of what the actual time signature is, the quarter note always must stay steady. And so that's where I think these two terms and skills kind of come together, that that's the goal for our students is to find that smaller pulse, the micro pulse, and keep that consistent throughout. Um, one other example of this with actual mixed meter, again by Kevin Olson, is in this Impressions on Color book, and it's the Impressions on Red, the very first piece in the book, begins in 7-8, then goes to 4-8, then goes back to 7-8 and 4-8, and there's some 6-8 and 2-4 and other things mixed in later, but it sounds like this. So in this example of 7-8, it's 1-2-3. And then one, two, three, four. One, two, three, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So you have to have that eighth note pulse being very consistent. Now, what ends up happening in a piece like this or in Crimson is that we start grouping those and feeling then the bigger beats which change. It becomes this like play with quarters versus dotted quarters for how you feel the bigger beat. But again, the microbeat has to be consistent. Other examples of mixed meter that are a little bit different would be things like Run Run from the children's album by Octavio Pinto or Clowns from the Circus by Joaquin Torino, which I do have a video on and I will be sure to link that there. Those are pieces which have vastly different sections that are in different meters because they're very programmatic pieces. So while Clowns begins in, um, I believe it's 2-4, but I'm not actually looking at it. <laughs> Later on it has 3-8, but those are changing sections for that programmatic idea. Okay, so let's talk about Crimson. I love this piece because it encapsulates so many ideas that are prevalent in the style of early and mid 20th century piano masters such as Bartok and Kabalevsky and many, many others who wrote wonderfully for the piano. We have this asymmetrical melody, sorry, asymmetrical rhythm. We have a modal melody. It sounds to me like Lydian mode, although it doesn't stay there, but we have this um, kind of a C major or C resting tone with the raised fourth. And then it changes to kind of a minor, you know, happens again later towards the end of the piece, we have it on F, which again just means there's a B natural. So I love that use of the mode and it's, it still sounds like I can hear where the resting tone is, where the tonic note is, but it just sounds a little funky and cool. All right, we have all of these repeated notes as the accompaniment pattern. The right hand in measure five begins on G. I would recommend for this a fingering of three, two, one, 
two, three, two, one. So you're doing three, two, one, two, three, two, one, three, two, one, two, one, two, three, two, one, which gives you the natural correct accent for the seven, eight time signature. Now the truth of the matter is, if my student was not executing that correctly, this would not be a hill I would die on. Partly because later on they're gonna do the repeated notes as little chords. And they don't have the ability to change fingers when you're playing an interval or set of intervals like that. So the main thing I would want is for them to try different fingerings as they're playing the repeated note and to keep a very relaxed wrist. That this doesn't, this doesn't become you know, this kind of thing. But instead, there's some flexibility and they're kind of moving in and out on the key. Now, part of the reason that needs to be flexible and light is because it's a very boring part. It's the same note over and over again, and the melody is in the left hand. So. So that goes to balance, and you are going to need to work on balance with your student if you work on this piece. We also have some very extreme dynamics, and uh, that leads to a programmatic feel for the whole piece. Starrer says in his introduction to these pieces that you actually do not need to use the title, that the, the idea of the colors given as titles are very personal reflections. So you can use the title of crimson as a starting jumping off point you know, what is the color crimson and what does that mean to you? It's not just red, it's crimson. What might your student imagine? But once your student knows the piece, I would always also encourage coming up with his or her own title. What does the music of this piece draw to their imagination and what do they hear? Does this sound kind of like a machine that's kind of chugging along or something mechanical in that way? I don't know, you can come up with whatever you want, but my point is there needs to be some sort of imaginative involvement here because we have such a wide range of dynamics. We start forte, uh, then we have pianissimo for that first iteration of the melody, then it's piano, then you have a big crescendo to mezzo forte. second half ramps up the same way so that when you get to the very end you've got fortissimo with a crescendo at the end. So that ending just has to be incredibly loud with very short staccatos, very sharp accents to get that effect of being this really bump bump at the very end. This last little bit should be the biggest and most in tempo and you know you can't slow down it has to just be bop bop we're at the end that kind of thing i hope that's given you a few ideas on how to teach crimson from the sketches in color by robert starr and a few thoughts on how to in general teach mixed meter or asymmetrical meter one last comment about teaching kind of contemporary styles or unusual sounds i think it's most effective when students do them to the max when they really go for it. Sometimes when students play things that sound dissonant in their harmony or strange in their melodic contour or rhythmically complex, they actually kind of shy away from it and act a little bit apologetically like, sorry, this is dissonant and sounds a little weird. That actually makes the piece lose its effect. And instead, if students can go for it and really press into what those things are that make this piece interesting and vibrant and exciting, then it has a much better effect when you're performing it. And I would want to encourage my students to love the really interesting and unique sounds in this particular piece. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Share this video with a friend or a colleague if you found it helpful. And I wish you all the best in your teaching.